yes, we are नमस्कार सहर टॉकिस के शो गपास्टिक पे आप लोगों का फिर से एक बार स्वागत है आज हमारे साथ अमेरिका से एक थिएटर एक्सपर्ट एरिन बी मी हमारे साथ हैं और हम उनसे उनके अपने रंगमंच के बारे में निजी रंगमंच के बारे में और बात करेंगे अभी जो हाल फिलहाल चल रहा है दूसरा जो उनका जो काम है भारतीय रंगमंच के ऊपर हमें से बहुत कम लोग इस बात से परिचित हो गए कि उन्होंने बहुत सारा काम जो है भारत के रंगमंच के ऊपर किया है तो आज की कैपासिटी इंग्लिश में होगी उसके पहले मैंने हिंदी में एक थोड़ा सा आपको जिस देने की कोशिश की है सो नाउ वी आर स्टार्टिंग टूडे Today is really a wonderful day for Sahar Talkies. We have put our second baby step towards international capacity. Last month we had a conversation with Professor Gert Tauber, a children theatre expert from Germany. Today we are having Professor Erin Bimming on our platform. She is a faculty of drama at this New New York University, a center known all over the world. First of all, I would like to welcome Professor Erin Bimming. on our platform and would like to thank her for accepting our invitation so happily and readily i know it it couldn't have possible if she was not so keen about indian theater and indian theater practitioners those who know erin me's work on indian theater understand what a novel research work she has done and now that is available in a book form to title theater of roots redirecting modern indian stage it's a wonderful work particularly if you don't want to miss the major turn and twist called theater of roots movement in indian theater after independence my phd title the poetics and politics of subversion in theater of roots is very much inspired by her seminal work which is duly credited in my thesis when i was looking for my phd topic i was developing three different synopses altogether the first one and i was and i am still keen on working is the post dramatic theater scenario in india the second one was on was on concept of beauty aesthetics and rasa i still eager to work more on it and the third was theater of roots movement as it was in my regular progression of my mp topic which deals with development of traditional theater forms of india called bidesia but i wanted deeply to break away from this regular progression as suggested by many and choose a different topic then one day i found the book written by erin and just after finishing it i was sorted that i am working on the very topic theater of roots this was the appeal and magic of that book upon me so in a manner she is my distant mentor that's why i was always keen to have a discussion on our forum with her who must have inspired many other than me she is not only an ardent researcher but also a very good practitioner and director of drama she is currently pursuing a new kind of theater practice known as digital performance which is very much in talk in recent times especially after covid 19 outbreak we'll talk about all this in the session so welcome eri very very warm welcome from india thank you so much um i, I don't speak hindi uh eniki korach korach malayalam mariam apo english il samsarikana yes so uh, eri it's, it's a pleasure meeting you and having you here for sahar talk is the past session as we are fond of slow progression let me begin with a customary question what led you to drama and theater arts well um uh, both my parents were writers and both of them loved the theater so although when i was growing up neither one of them were involved in theater my father later when i was in college uh became a a playwright and um became quite well known but when i was growing up um he was a an editor at a he named them for us Oh, uh my mother is Susie Me and my father is Charles Me. Uh and uh so they took me to the theater often uh and to the opera. I would they would pile their coats on the chair and I would sit on top of the coats so that I could see uh up over the seats in front of me. So I had growing up in New York City, I had a I was very privileged to have access to a lot of really interesting theater. Um and so even as a young kid i saw the work of grotowski i saw the work of richard schechner i saw the work of uh the performance group and mabu minds and richard foreman and um contour uh tadeusz contour pina bausch all of these amazing artists came through new york um i also have to say there was one moment um my introduction 
to, I, I don't want to give away the punchline, but I was never allowed to watch television when I was a kid. So one day I was down at my friend's house, down, she lived downstairs from us, and we were watching television. And my father called and he said, it's time to come home. So I had to confess. I said, Dad, I can't come home right now. I have to admit I'm watching television. I'm watching this great show and I just can't leave in the middle. And he said, well, what is the show called? I said, it's called Much Ado About Nothing. And he said, well, I happen to have the script. And I thought, how do you have the script to this amazing TV show? He said, uh, if you, you have to come home now, but we can read the play together. And so that was the beginning of my understanding and appreciation for Shakespeare, um, was we read Much Ado About Nothing together. Of course, he took all the male roles. Um, and so he had a lot more to say than I did. But, um, but that was the beginning of my, you know, and so it grew from there. Oh, and when you decided that you will work in the field of theater? Uh, I was in college doing theater and I loved doing theater and I kept doing it and kept doing it even when it meant sometimes handing assignments in late and things like that. And suddenly I thought, well, if this is what I'm doing even when I should be doing something else. There's something about my love for theater and performance that maybe I should begin to take seriously. Maybe it's not just a hobby or an extracurricular activity, but maybe it's something I should continue to do with my life. Um, when I was graduating from college, my father sensed um, my interest in theater and my sort of fear of going into it. And he asked me two questions uh, that I think are very important. One is, he said, what would you do if you didn't have to make money at it? And I said, theater. And then he said, what would you do if you didn't have to be good at it? And that was a very interesting question for me because I didn't want to do something that I wasn't going to be good at. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know yet, I didn't have enough experience to know if I was going to be good at theater. But he made me realize that it, it doesn't matter for two reasons. One, if it makes you happy, then that's what's important. And the second thing is, if you're a smart person and it's something you love to do, you will figure out how to be good at it. You will work at it, you will study it, you will write until you are good at it. And so eventually that question won't matter. So that was when I decided to go into theater. So just for Indian audience, uh, you can so that, so that we can understand it better. In India, you know that there are several amateur theater groups which are working here and there in each, each city, every city of India, large or small. They are primarily not making money. They are simply amateur theater groups or out of luck of theater, they are doing theater. What is the scenario of theater uh, in New York or in America? Are there amateur theater groups there or, or totally as we, we may might be in the illusion that there are only professional theater groups there existing? Well, this is a great question. And actually, I, I just want to say a couple of uh, anti-capitalist um, things. Uh, first of all, I think this definition of pr a professional theater person as someone who is paid, uh, is a definition we need to get rid of. Uh, we need to dismantle this definition. I would say that in India, I know numerous people who are amazing artists who are not making money from the theater. That does not make them any less professional than anyone else on the planet who is being paid for their work. So I think that this capitalistic notion that if you get paid for it, you're a professional. And if you don't get paid for it, you're an amateur. And an amateur is somehow less than a professional, I think is a dichotomy that we need to dismantle. Um, so let's start here and now. <laughs> um, and thanks I, uh, for voicing it. Pardon? Thanks for voicing it. No, I mean, it's important, right? Uh, I just saw someone actually 
post on Facebook and she posted a check she received from a theater and she said, oh, I finally made it. I'm successful. And I thought, wow, that that's sad to me that our notion of success is receiving a check from someone. I hope we will all define ourselves in a larger way than receiving a check. So I would like to not define my art or anyone else's by the amount of money that they make. I mean, and also on the flip side of that, there are plenty of people who make a lot of money and um, their artwork is not great. So, right? Uh, so, um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Second of all, New York has an ecosystem where obviously there is Broadway. That's, I think, the most well-known and people do get paid. And then there are smaller theaters like the Public Theater in New York Theater Workshop, the Signature Theater, where people get paid, but not as much as a Broadway contract. And then there are numerous theaters where people are really working for the love of making theater and the love of sharing an artistic experience with an audience. Um, they are very professional. Their work is very high quality. It's excellent. These are people who have studied and, you know, worked and, um, but they are making their money from doing other things. Um, so there's a lot of that. I would say that um, in my experience in India, very few people get paid, perhaps one or two people in Mumbai, a couple of people in Bangalore, Delhi, right? But most of the money comes from teaching or, I mean, I guess uh, in Mumbai, you can have these commercial hits that maybe eventually people make money from, but that's not true in most of the country. So I think, I think Anjum Katyal, um, who's, I'm sure you know Anjum's work, uh, once used the phrase, um, oh, and now I'm having pandemic brain, I can't remember what the phrase is, but anyway, again, this notion that someone who makes money is better than, or something like that, someone who doesn't, I think it's time to get rid of that. Well, then my next question is, uh, we have, you were talking about India. So my question, what brought you to India? And why and how you become so interested in Indian performances? Was it just an academic encounter or does it have anything to do with Indian performing styles? Oh, that is a great question. And let me think about all the answers. There are so many answers to that question. Um, I first went to India. I was working at the Guthrie Theatre in Minneapolis and I had... Um, I had uh, earned so much overtime from working 24-7 that I had um, several paid weeks and I thought, okay, I've got to go somewhere. This is my chance to travel. And I had always wanted to go to India, but I never somehow thought I would actually get there. And I thought, this is the moment I'm going to go. Um, and I had a, a, a person who at that point was a friend is now my husband of 30 years. Um, and he started uh, setting me up. He had uh, friends in Delhi. So for example, I don't know if you're familiar with TAG, um, but he knew a couple of members of TAG in Delhi. And so I spent a couple of weeks in Delhi working with TAG and with the Salam Balak Trust, doing some theater exercises with the um, kids in the uh, railway program. Uh, then I went down to Kerala and I was at a, one of those tourist productions of Kadagali just to get, you know, introduced to it. You know, one of those tourist things uh, where the actual production lasts 15 minutes. You're like, wait a minute, that totally destroyed everything that actually makes this genre interesting. But anyway, um, uh, and there was somebody there who was on his way to a theater festival in Tiruvananthapuram and said, oh, Kavalam Narayana Panikar, who I had never heard of, is organizing this festival mm -hmm. and you can go. And so Which I got on. I'm just interrupting. Which year this was? 1991. 1991. Yeah. Uh, and so I got on a train and I went down to Trivandrum 
with, you know, my backpack. I checked into a hotel. I went to the festival. Um, and, uh, it was, he had organized, uh, a day of Kuriatam, a day of Kadagali, some Teatam, Murieta, uh, Mohiniatam, yes. uh, Kalari Payata, and then a production of one of his plays, which was Madhima Vyayogam, which is uh, his version of the Bhasa play. And so suddenly I saw the entire, I mean, not the entire range, but a really amazing range of kinds of Indian performance. And again, luckily, he had people there who would, so when I was watching Kuriatam, there was somebody doing a line by line kind of gestural translation so that I really understood what I was seeing. The same thing with the Kadakali. And then when I saw his work, my mind exploded. And I thought, this is the kind of work I have been trying to make for years now. And I was trying to cherry pick this aspect from here and that thing from there and that thing from there. And suddenly there it was. And I thought, this is the work I want to make. And this is the person whose work I want to study. So that was in March, April, May, something like that. I came back in December and did a workshop. I came back the following summer. I came back the following December. Then I got a Fulbright and I was able to spend, you know, for four months um, working with his theater company. And that was when he invited me to direct a play with his company. Um, so I got to work with the most amazing performers. That company is incredible. You're talking uh, about Sorry? You are talking about Sopanam. Sopanam, yeah, yeah. Then and now, one of the most amazing theater companies in the world. Um, uh, and it, long association with Sopanam and Kavlam Nana and Panikkar. Sorry? You had a very long association with Sopanam and Kavlam Nana and Panikkar. Please let us know your views on the group or and the person. Oh, I... I um I mean my views are that I just feel so fortunate to have been able to work with Panikar Sar and with Sopanam uh the most amazing people um and the most incredible and inspiring work um Panikar is the one who introduced me to the notion of rasa uh and to a way of working that generates a rasic experience uh, in the United States, many directors are told that they need to be faithful to the play, which is to say they need to serve the playwright. And Panikar comes out of a tradition of Kuriatam, where, as most of you know, most of you who are listening to this know, but I'm going to say it anyway, if you take what I think of as an eight-page play written down, right, at least you know, something like Urubangam, something like um, uh, Swapnava Savadatam, something, whatever. Um, that takes 41 nights to perform in a, in a Kuriatam thing because you take a line of text and the performer elaborates on it. The performer makes political and social analogies, et cetera, et cetera, gives you their backstory. Um, and so the play is performed on the 41st or final night and you have all of this um, wonderful set of associations to bring to that final performance so the play is 141st of the experience in the united states we think of the play as the thing that you support you honor you right it's very logocentric um but pun pardon the text is a sacred thing for you it is it is and as a director i had been taught to tell the story to follow the text to be faithful to the text and punnicker said to me in rehearsal to, one day he said what are you doing i said well you know i'm telling the story he said why would you want to do that and i said oh because i thought that's what i was supposed to do he said no 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 
the point is to make it's the the point is the how not the what the point is the why not the what and so he completely changed my approach to directing and in fact to writing and to thinking about theater and i'm currently working on a book about rasa and my argument is that rasa is actually much more central to 20 and 21st century theater in the west even than aristotle which is to say everybody talks about you know the well-made play and linear narrative and blah 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 but the most interesting work of the 20th and 21st century has not been aristotelian i would actually argue it's been russic edward gordon craig gertrude stein um, Tadashi Suzuki, Anne Bogart, Robert Wilson, um, Artaud. These are all household names in the United States and in Europe. Um, and I would argue that their work is Russic rather than cathartic. And so at Punica really opened my eyes to these other ways of thinking about theater. Uh... Can you just a uh, little bit uh, go deeper into the performing style of Panikkar? What kind of plays, how he used to make his plays, if you can share, you want to share with us? I can. Um, <laughs> um, I'm laughing just because it brings back the fondest memories. Uh, and at some point I should dig out all of the audio tapes that I have from the early 90s and the, you know, things because what he would do and i stayed with him in his house for a long time so i would be sitting there and the phone would ring and somebody would have a question and then somebody would come in and then he would sit he would get an idea for a poem and he would leave and he would sit and he would write the poem you know that he started out wanting to be or not maybe not wanting to be but he was going to be a lawyer mm -hmm. and he was taking the, ex the legal exam mm -hmm. and suddenly he got an idea for a poem and he turned over the exam and he started writing the poem on the back. And the examiner said, what are you doing? This is, you're supposed to be taking this exam. You're going to fail this exam. He said, when inspiration strikes, you need to honor, you know, so he wrote the poem, failed the exam <laughs> and the rest is history. Um, and so he was like that throughout his life. He would get inspired and he would sit and he would work or he would dictate to me and I would write down or, um, he would start to write an essay and then he would give it to me and I would do some work and then hand it back and then but he used to have just he used to have this wonderful chair with these very two long kind of arms that that sat out in front and they were piled with books and notebooks and things and um one day somebody cleaned it up and he came back and he said oh what have you done I, can, I need my mess I need my mess to because it's to some people it looked very disorganized you know he would be writing uh, a bit of dialogue for a play and somebody would come and ask him for a song for something and so he would sit with them and sing and and write the song and uh and then they would go away and he would come back and then the phone would ring and then something would happen and then it would be you know i don't know time for something else um and so he used to have a colleague who would occasionally mutter to me, you know, I wish he would just sit and write the plays. Why can't he just stay focused? But I think that each of those things became part of the creative juice that was floating around in his body and came out in the most amazingly poetic writing and poetry and... Um, You know, it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Uh, is, that, is that enough detail? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just uh, continuing okay. the discussion. In your book, <laughs> Theater of Roots, uh, Redirecting Modern Indian Stays, you focus on two directors and a playwright. What was the reason behind it? Um, the reason behind it was that I was trying to make an argument about what the theater of roots was and what it did, how it functioned at a particular historical moment. And so 
Panikkar was very consciously trying to, he talked all the time about decolonizing the theater, right? Um, and he talked about using Sanskrit drama, the Natya Shastra, Kuriyatam, Kadakali, Mohiniyatam, Sopanam Sangeetam, Murieta, Teyam, you know, Kaleri Payeta, all of these things he used. So that was um, a very useful case study in which I could make it clear what the Roots Movement was about and what it did. Um, I would say that Panikkar is also a playwright and a director. So I, I, so I did focus on one of his plays, but I did also give a lot of attention to his work with Sanskrit drama because that was pathbreaking in India. Um, I focused on Karnad because Hayavadna was one of those sort of poster child plays, right, uh, for the theater of roots movement. It was translated into numerous languages, and it was one of the first plays that, um, Indian plays that really began to travel around the country and be done by a lot of people, and even in colleges, and, you know, um, and so I sort of thought, okay, let's look at the dramaturgical structure of this, what is he doing? Why is this different from your average Ibsen play or Shakespeare or whatever? Um, and um, so that, again, provided a very useful case study and the ways in which he incorporated um, a Ganesh Puja at the beginning and um, Yakshagana and all, you know, uh, was just, I mean, it's a brilliant play. Um, Theum's work I focused on uh, because uh, we'll see what happens with Manipur in the future, whether it continues to become part of India or whether it breaks off and becomes its own country, in which case um, I would argue that the particular kinds of roots that Theum was returning to are the local roots of Manipur, right? Ras Lila, um, uh, Tanta, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and uh, that that in the case of Manipur's relationship to the to the rest of India, that is seen as theater of roots if you look at it from a sort of national perspective. But it's a very regional theater if you look at it really from the perspective of Manipur. And Tiam says, you know, no one in Delhi understood what I was doing. They just thought of it as lovely sort of Manipuri exotica. And in fact, often he thinks included him in these international, in these national theater festivals so that they could get credit for including Manipur. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think it's more than that. I think it's that his work is really brilliant. Um, but it is true, you know, I went up to Manipur um, on a trip and I took Tangta classes and I saw Ras Lila and, you know, um, at that point, you were not allowed to go for more than 10 days. You can't get a visa for Manipur for more than 10 days. Um, but his work was very local. And so I think that provides a kind of counter narrative to the nationalistic narrative of the rest of the roots movement, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If I want, if I ask you, uh, can you discuss about the, the nature of work which Kavlak Nayan Panikar sir has done and Radhantyam has done? There are set, uh, different kind of works. They are, they are part of the theater of roots movement. But what difference you 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 find there in their theater practice? Well, okay, let me talk about the similarities first. Yeah, yes. I think they both have invested deeply in training their companies, right? So Panikar's company and Theum's company, they've both been fortunate enough to stay together for long enough that they build, uh, have built a vocabulary. Now, Panikar's vocabulary is different from Theum's vocabulary, right? But the fact that they have had the time and ability to build a vocabulary for the company is rare, I think, uh, anywhere in the world. Um, Pina Bausch was able to do that, Suzuki, and Bogart. Um, you know, there are some 
a few people who have done that. Um, so I would say that's a similarity. I would say that that also in both cases comes from martial arts. In this case from Kaleri Payeta, in this case from Tangta. Um, but what the what those martial arts teach you about how to use your body and uh, energy flow and Tangta, I can't demonstrate sitting in a chair, but uh, Tangta, you're doing this with your head, right? And you're doing something separate with your feet. So it teaches you the same kind of embodied understanding. You know, when an actor is in a scene, it's really easy to just improvise with somebody else, right? It's also very easy just to recite your lines. To both recite the lines, to stick to the plan, and yet to be alive and improvising with the other performer, that's the difficulty, right? And in a way, that dichotomy is built into the physical training of Tangta. Less so Kaleri Payeta, which is a little bit different. But, um, uh, and so I would say that the actor training or the commitment to actor training, the commitment to poetry um, is very similar. I would say that the um, their thematic interests are very, very different. And obviously then the expression of the theater is different, which is to say Panikar's theater really comes from Kerala and TM's theater really comes from Manipur. Um, and those are two very different languages, histories, cultures, etc. Um, and TM is very concerned with the bloodshed, the violence uh, in Manipur, which exists in Kerala, but in an entirely different way. So Panigar is interested in a um, in a I would say a more kind of unifying. Um, uh, I would say that his productions are very, were very kind of Sanskrit influenced, which is to say Hindu influenced, right? But Kerala has always been um, a multi-religious place, right? Um, and uh, so I think that there's a certain amount of attempt to kind of bring that together. Theum lives in a state where there is state violence. And if you, uh, at least when I was there in 2004, which admittedly is 15 plus years ago, you would come out of the airport and there would be soldiers with guns pointed at you as you left the airport. And so it was a, it was a police state. And the violence that, and the particular kind of violence that comes with that is what Theum was really interested in talking about um, when I was looking at his work. And then in sort of... Um, later in kind of attempts at peace, right? Nine Hills, One Valley was a really a cry for peace and end to this, you know, bombings and etc. Is that useful? Yeah. So one question which is there with me when I was reading your book, I think long back, almost 12 years or 10, 12 years back, when I was reading your book, this question come to my mind. There's a great omission, you know, in your book, which I found, that uh, you haven't dealt with the works of Habib Tanvi while discussing Indian theater of roots movement. So that question was stuck in my mind at that point of time. Why you omitted that kind of a personality who has worked a lot in that? How it happened? Um, I think it really happened because of access and length. Uh, I mean, I mentioned Tanvir, right? There are many people that I mentioned that I couldn't cover. Um, uh, and I was actually, there was at one point I was going to have a chapter on Chandraleka as well. Yeah. Um, uh, but I cut that um, chapter. I can't really remember why I cut that one. Tanvir... Um, was really interesting. His work is very interesting and again, path breaking and, you know, um, uh, but I didn't, um, 
I wasn't able to go and work with him and you know I I wanted to make sure that my research was not second or third hand. Um, there are a couple of books about Indian theater that have been written. Um, there was, for example, a book, I'm not going to quote the author or the, but who said that Mai Tai performance is tribal. Now, the Mai Tais in Manipur are the royal family. Mm -hmm. They're not tribal. So that kind of basic mistake can only be made by someone who hasn't gone to Manipur. Right? Yeah, yeah. The minute you go to Manipur, you know that the Mai Tais are not, the, they're not the Nagas, they're not the, right? It's, um, so I didn't want to, I, I have, when I was working with Panikar, I worked with him for like 10 years before I published that book, or 20 years. I went to Manipur, I saw all of Thiam's work, I, you know, right, I, um, I took Tangta classes myself so that I would know what that does to the body. Uh, in the case of Karnad, because I have family in Bangalore, I was able to go and stay and interview him a lot and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, I sort of had no uh, access to Tanvir, and I thought there are other people who are better equipped to write about Tanvir than I am. I don't want to be the person who does the equivalent of saying that Mai Tai is yeah. tribal culture. Like, I just, I don't want to be that person. Achha, one uh, one question which is there in my mind that when you were working with uh, Kavlam Nayan Panikkar sir or later with Ratan Pina in the later days, that was the time theater of roots movement has already uh, gone from India. I think 1994 was the last time when SNA did its last uh, national festival. After that, they brought down its own yeah, scheme. So, oh, so when you were there working or writing that book, the theater of roots movement was already finished, I think. In India. So do you think this was a natural progression of the movement? Or it has happened, uh, it cut down the whole movement. What was the reason behind all this? Wait, did I think it was the what of the, the literal progression? The, the natural progression of the movement, the theater of the movement, which is started, it has to lead somewhere. But I think after the point of time, in, in, after 1995, Suddenly, it go to the earth. It, it starts there. It's just it. Well, I would say two or three or four or ten things. Um, mm -hmm. I'll try to choose the most relevant. Um, first of all, I'm not sure that the movement has entirely died in the sense that there are still so many people doing this kind of work. I think that it doesn't fall under the bracket of decolonizing Indian theater and blah, 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 right? I think that theater of Mo the theater of roots movement came out of a particular historical moment, right? People like Panikar, um, who again, you know, was born in, uh, I believe, 28. Uh, no, is that right? 28 or 38. Uh, okay, I'm about to, um, uh, who was born before independence, right? And was told if you want to do theater, you do it on a proscenium and here's what it looks like. And it has A leads to B leads to C, etc. Da, 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 ba, 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 and then there's a climax. And he began to say, what would Indian theater look like if we hadn't been colonized, right? Uh, and Karnad was asking a similar kind of question from another perspective. Tanvir was doing another thing from another perspective, right? So uh, Shanta, Gandhi, uh, Shanta Gandhi, right? All these, there were, um, but I think that there also was a fear in the early days of the Indian Republic that India would split into hundreds of states or municipalities, right? It was not exactly a united um, country, as we know from the, um, I stumbled, by the way, one time on a walk in a park, I stumbled upon the house of Oud, you know, where the, pr the princess supposedly lived, the woman who spent many years at the railway station living on her carpets, um, who maybe was or wasn't, uh, we, you know, I know there's, but in other words, I think that, um, the question of what is India 
after independence was a huge question. Hmm. By the 90s, there was no fear that India would split up anymore into other things, right? And so that's when um, people began to be able to extend the questions further. Instead of saying, this is Indian theater, saying, well, why are all these um, well-known theater directors and playwrights Hindu men? Where are the women? Where are the Muslims? Where are the Christians? Where are the right other kind of um, minority groups? Where are the Dalit groups? Why is everyone right upper caste? Um, and uh, so I think that really Indian theater just began to expand. Um, and so the the particular question of the roots movement had kind of been asked and answered and gave way to a multiplicity of answers and more questions and that I think are continuing to go on now. There's a group in Mumbai um, uh, that do, uh, that loiter. And I know it doesn't seem like theater, it doesn't happen on a proscenium stage, there isn't a script, there isn't a, but it's a performative social action um, that I think is really fascinating. They're trying to create space for women. Or what <clears throat> Maya Rao is doing with the walk and with her performances, I, which I guess you could also argue because of her training comes out of the Theater of Roots movement, but you wouldn't look at, well, actually you do look at her, I think, and say, ah, she's Kathakali trained because you can see that in her training, right? But she's not putting on a headgear or makeup or, you know, She's doing uh, the walk, which she actually did at JNU. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, I think the, I think Roots spoke to a particular post-independence moment, right? And now has expanded to include many other things. Mm -hmm. So now I'm leading to uh, other steps, uh, leaving behind the data Roots movement. Even in the global scenario, where do Indian theater performances stand? Who are the directors whose works are being noticed and acclaimed internationally from India? You have seen uh, Indian theater and you're seeing the, the Western theater also. So, just I would So, I would say that um, uh, from India, the people whose work is seen depends on festivals. So for example, Ratantiam has been to many, many festivals, Edinburgh and um, Amala Lana's work has traveled quite a bit um, and was honored at the Kennedy Center. Um, uh, that was her piece, Nati Binodini, um, which was a fantastic piece. Um, Zuleka Chaudhary works uh, in a number of ways in a number of places. Um, I would say that um, in terms of play scripts being read, um, I would say that the work of Panikur, the work of um, Tanvir has been translated well. Uh, you know, all of those Seagull publications uh, and some of the Oxford University Press publications have been working their way around um, to universities in the UK and the US at least. Um, I think it's harder if you're in Italy or France because then there's an additional language barrier, right? Um, uh, Mahesh Datani has quite a career in the United States. Um, he works a lot in New Jersey. He works, uh, he's worked at Barnard College. He's worked out in Colorado. Um, he's had his plays, he's had three productions brought to New York. Um, so people are quite familiar with his work. And of course he writes in English. So that makes it a little bit easier to, um, uh, but I, uh, well, I would say also, I think um, many people in the US have heard of Saftar Hashmi. Um, and the street theater. Um, I would say they've heard of Mangai, of Triparati Sharma. Um, trying to think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's a lot of work. There's also, there are a lot of, at least in the US, at least in New York, um, 
groups of Indian Americans doing theater uh, together. And um, so that, uh, so there's also sort of work from the Indian diaspora uh, that's happening. And in England, there's Tara Arts, which you must be familiar with, right? Started by Jatindra Varma, and now someone else has taken over, yeah. Thank you, thank you for answering this question. Yeah, so now let's turn to your own theater practice. Can you just let us know about your journey as a theater practitioner and director? Uh, my journey, in what sense? A journey as a theater practitioner, so how you started directing plays and... Um, well, my first directing project was when I was 13. I didn't get cast in a play. I was very upset. Um, and because the character spoke French and I spoke French and the woman who was cast did not speak French, but she was older than me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I gathered a bunch of kids from the neighborhood and did a kind of vaudeville variety show, which was really fun. Um, so that was the first, um, thing I ever directed. What? Must be a revel in your childhood. Sorry? It must be a revel in your child childhood. Yes, yeah. Um, and then um, I directed a horrendous production of a Brecht play uh, in college. It was just so poorly directed, I can't even think of it. Um, but then uh, as time went on, I began directing more and more um, uh, after college and did a piece that was well reviewed in the New York Times and so it moved from this very small theater to the public. Um, and then I've directed, you know, all around and then at some point, uh, let's see, I started working at the Guthrie Theater and that's where I really got an education on how to work on classical plays. Um, and uh, recently, starting in 2013, I started my own theater company and we do site-specific plays. So we do plays in swimming pools, bathtubs, um, cafes, uh, things like that. In fact, we were, um, our pool play went to ITFOC in 2017, the International Theater Festival of Kerala. Um, uh, and so that's interesting to me because site-specific theater really comments on the site and uses the site as part of the um part of the story and part of the piece um so that's what i'm really working on now and of course during covid i've been working more and more on digital theater we had um we have done some site-specific audio plays in the past and uh so we did another one during covid and then we've been using these online gaming platforms um to create online theater uh, since COVID. In use of media, multimedia and digital mediums is not a new thing in theater performances. But these days, especially after COVID-19 outbreak, we are hearing a lot about digital performance. You yourself has, are involved in such performances. For our audience, can you just elaborate what do you mean by digital performance and how it is different from multimedia or other media loaded performances? Right, this is a great question. So I would say that um, multimedia performance uh, was in its early years uh, bringing media onto the stage. So it would be primarily an online staged theatrical event that would be augmented with a live feed camera from off stage or something like that, right? And I'm thinking here about the work of um, the Worcester Group or, um, um, oh goodness, um, one of my favorite directors and I'm spacing on his name. Um, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, uh, Ivo Van Hove. Um, has played a lot of, uh, with um, multimedia material in his work, right? Um, but again, that was sort of within the context of live theater. So it was 
film, video, interactive video, et cetera, coming into and becoming part of the live theatrical event or media being used as the set, right? Against which a live performer would perform, right? There's a lot of that. Um, and, uh, but I would say, and then when the pandemic came, I think the first things that many of us saw were, um, films of live performances, which is to say, um, I got to see two governors from the National Theater, right? But that was a live performance that they filmed, that they were then streaming online. So I don't count that as a digital performance. I think that's a film of a live, like it's, um, that's a way of documenting a live performance. And I'm grateful that I had an opportunity to see it and it was lots of fun and very funny and, um, but uh, to me, that's not what I call either multimedia or digital performance, but that is a lot of what people have been consuming. To me, digital performance is what's happening now. And if you want, I can begin to share my screen and show you some example. Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Please, please. Uh, let's see. Um, So now if I go, where is play? Huh? Okay. Um, so for example, uh, here you have on the left, uh, a section of, uh, well, a character, Patrick Hearson. Uh, this is from a Twitter play called The 15th Line. And this is a play that playwright Jeremy Gable wrote specifically for Twitter, which is to say he didn't adapt a, a, a piece from the stage for Twitter. So this is four characters tweeting once or twice a day for eight weeks. So this is the beginning, I think, of creating dramaturgical structures that are different online than they are on the stage. The bottom right um, is Avatar Repertory Theater's Oedipus Rex, which takes place in Second Life. Um, and then the top right is a piece I did called Life on Earth, which I did on the gaming platform Discord. Um, and so again, that was designed to be, it was not, it was not designed to bring media to a stage, it was designed to be online. And so that's what I'm calling digital performance. If it's born digital, meant to be digital. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <clears throat> there was, oh gosh, my slide. Um, there was a production of Romeo and Juliet on Instagram. That was already a few years ago. And it was a really interesting adaptation of Romeo and Juliet that actually used Instagram to tell the story. Um, we have an audio piece called Subway Plays, which is set on the New York City subway, and you download the recording onto your phone and take it on the subway. So again, that was always meant to be an audio recording that interacted with a live site, right? So again, this is what I begin to call um, digital performance. Here are some of the tweets from the characters from the 15th line. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating because, again, in quote unquote traditional theater, whatever that is, um, you know, you show up at eight o'clock and you designate two hours to sit in the theater and watch a show. So it requires a certain kind of commitment in that sense. This requires less commitment over the course of a single day, but more commitment over the course of the eight weeks that it takes, right? And you also have to, you become the actor. You have to read, it's like closet, a new form of closet drama. You're reading the tweets and interpreting them, you know, yourself, turning uh, them into prosody. So this is um, uh, from Romeo and Juliet on Instagram. So the top left is Paris. Then you've got on the bottom left, Romeo and Juliet. And this is Rosalind on the right. And um, the, the, interesting thing about it was that it both commented on Romeo and Juliet and on the ages of the characters and level of maturity and etc. Um, 
but it also was a commentary on Instagram in the sense that it really did comment on how people interact with each other over Instagram and what kinds of interactions do and don't happen over Instagram. Um, it's still up. If you Google BuzzFeed Romeo and Juliet, you can see uh, all the posts and follow the characters. Um, here is uh, some photos of the Staten Island Ferry. Um, <clears throat> we also did, this is not a theater company, did a site specific audio play that you download onto your phone. And um, <clears throat> Act One takes, uh, it it's all has, takes place on the ferry. Act One goes from Manhattan to Staten Island, and Act Two goes from Staten Island to New York. And again, I think what's interesting about some of these digital performances is that they take place at any time of the day or night. You don't have to wear something special and go to the theater at eight o'clock. Um, <clears throat> you can go at four in the morning or five in the afternoon or whatever. You can do act one and then do act two two months later if you want. So there's a whole different way in which you can engage. Um, this is a trailer for Subway Plays. Subway Plays are show you a trilogy the... of site-specific audio plays for the N7 and L trains in New York City. Download the app from the App Store onto your phone. Go to the subway. Put your phone on airplane mode so you're not disturbed. Put in your earbuds, and as the train starts moving, press play. Subway has a rhythm of its own. You feel it? The train itself, it, it does what music does. It vibrates, always in a certain range. So I'm going to move on. This is a performance that was done on Zoom that was done actually quite well. And again, it was written specifically for Zoom. It's part of a whole series of plays, and the earlier versions were done live at the Public Theater in New York. But... Um, this uh, this was written and performed on Zoom. So again, I think this is different from multimedia performance in that it is meant to be and written for and performed specifically for Zoom, right? Um, this is the uh, platform Discord where we, I gathered people from all around the world actually, from China, from India, from Nepal, from Turkey, from the US, um, <clears throat> and people contributed various dances, poems, etc., about um, what it felt like to be in quarantine. And uh, uh, so we put them on this Discord piece, and it was actually very interesting because at some point audience members began to contribute too. Um, I'll show you just the first little bit. Videos don't work so well on Zoom, but... Um, So again, I'm going to go on. This is a student of mine <clears throat> that I worked with at the Shanghai Theater Academy. And again, she's just, what happens when you're stuck in your living room? Well, you dance in your own living room, in your sweatpants. She's really good. Um, <clears throat> We did also, this is not a theater company, did um, a piece we call Play in Your Bathtub, which is an immersive audio spa for physical distancing. So I began to think, okay, we can't get out and go to the theater together. What kind of theater can we do? Well, we can do theater in your own home. And at this point, I was very stressed out and I needed a long, hot, relaxing bath with some, you know, sense of jasmine. So we made a play that is actually takes place in your bathtub and you go into your bath and you run the water and you get a glass of wine or a cup of tea or whatever you want, some candles, uh, and listen to the audio play. Um, <clears throat> and I'll do if, uh, well, I'll play a little bit of it. There's some um, dances for fingers on the tip of the, on the surface of the water. There's some dances for toes. So it's interactive and participatory. 
I will share a little bit of that, and if you want to mute yourselves and sing along, you can. Let's sing together. I'll start and give you some time, during which you may respond in any way you wish. <clears throat> In the interest of time, I'm going to keep going. Um, this is an excerpt from Play in Your Bathtub was actually translated into Russian and done by the Wow 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 Theater in Moscow. So this is Sonia from the Wow 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 Theater. Um, and they had a, a Zoom sort of opening night presentation. Um, and um, she gave instructions and then everybody went off and experienced the, the play. Um, this is from Teatro Ciego. So this is another kind of pandemic digital performance, which I find interesting. Again, to go back to Rasa, I think it's kind of a literalization of Rasa in the sense that what they did was um, it's like ordering takeaway food. Um, they deliver dinner to your house in these boxes labeled one, two, three, four, um, with some wine, some water, uh, a candle, and an eye mask, and um, some lovely herbs to smell. <clears throat> and they send an audio along with it. And so you listen to the audio as you're eating. And so again, it's a kind of digital performance that is nonetheless live, right? Um, and in which I would argue actually Rasa is quite literalized. You are tasting um, the theatrical piece. Um, uh, in Argentina, also another group did a piece called Amor de Cuarentena. Um, and they would send recordings every day, just little short recordings. Um, you could choose one of five actors and they would send you the recordings and occasionally a photo, et cetera, et cetera. So, that's another digital piece. It, it happened through WhatsApp. It was designed for WhatsApp. It was meant to be, you know, for WhatsApp as opposed to something that was meant to be in a theater and then adapted to WhatsApp. Um, <clears throat> this is um, uh, Dan Hussein, and uh, he did uh, a couple of folk tales uh, and did this. Pardon? He does Dastan Goy. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And he did this on uh, Instagram, on Instagram Live. So he's done, again, some digital performances uh, that were meant to take advantage of these platforms that are available to us. Uh, this is a piece that uh, I did actually at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival called Guru of Touch. And again, it was a piece written specifically for Zoom. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, we performed it on Zoom and it ran for several weeks at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which um, went online when they couldn't uh, watched it wholly. I personally have watched it wholly on a platform. If you want to show it for our audience, it would be really nice. Wait, say again, what? I have watched it earlier somewhere on some platform, but if you want to share it wholly to, for our audience, it would be nice. Well, it's 22 minutes long. I think uh, we, can, we can. No, really? It, the problem is also though, um, I'll tell you what, I will, hang on. <clears throat> I'll give you the link. Um, come on. Uh, so that oy, oy, oy. Uh, people can watch it. So here is the link for Guru of Touch, which I will put in the chat. Now, where is my chat? I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Yeah. 
really a wonderful performance. Yes, they did. It, 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 the actors were incredible. The writing is magnificent. Um, <clears throat> whoops, wait a minute. And then I'll also give you the link to play in your bathtub, which includes the instructions. Where are we now? Oh, now it's going to start. Hang on. Pause, pause. I'm going to put that in the chat as well. Oops. Um, and then I'll go back to screen sharing. Where are we here? <clears throat> this, okay. So that was Guru of Touch. Um, oh, and just last night, I went to an interactive murder mystery. Uh, I don't know if you can see me up there. I'm playing the investigative journalist. Um, <clears throat> but here are some of the characters and then regular audience members. Um, and so we had somebody was murdered and we all had to uh, we were divided up into groups and we had to discuss and solve the murder and we had a chance to interview the characters and again it was done very well for zoom uh <clears throat> excellent acting and really excellent kind of clues given and um so i won't give away who the murderer is um but one of the other interesting things I think you can see from the last few slides is that one of the interesting things about digital theater is because we're no longer tied to real estate, you know, I'm zooming in on this call from Buenos Aires. There are some of you who are in Mumbai, some in Delhi, some in Calcutta. <clears throat> we can still get to, together on Zoom without visas, airfares, hotel rooms, you know, et cetera. So it does allow for a kind of international collaboration that wasn't possible. And I hope this will actually stick with us. Um, there is, um, <clears throat> I went to my 35th reunion on Shindig, which is a very interesting platform that um, I'm hoping to use this fall for a show because there are these performance spaces up at the top of the screen and audience members are down here hanging out. And if you want to, you can collaborate with a group of as many as six, can sort of have a private conversation even while the performance is going on um, <clears throat> and yet allow the performance to still continue. So it begins to mimic um, actual theater spaces better than Zoom. What, what platform is this? It's called Shindig. Shindig. Okay. S H I N D I G. Oh. Um, it's a wonderful platform. It's a little expensive, but it's a wonderful platform. And I'm just discovering Frame, which allows you to go into a um, a space. And, you know, I can put up a video or, in fact, I thought about asking you if we could meet on frame instead of Zoom, but uh, it's still in beta, so it crashes a lot. So I thought, okay, let's stick with Zoom for this. But um, it's a very interesting platform um, that I'm thinking about using for a number of different things. Um, and the background is customizable and et cetera. And you can really bring people in and have them walk around and talk to each other. And um, then you can show a video and there isn't that kind of delay that Zoom has. And there isn't that voice delay, which makes you know performance on Zoom so complicated. But these are some of the things that are going on. In other words, I think back um, in March uh, when the US kind of went into lockdown. I know China went in much earlier and many countries earlier and later, but um, <clears throat> a lot of people were sort of frozen thinking like, okay, now what do we do? Right. And a lot of what we saw were people trying to stream things that had previously been live. 
But I think we're now at a moment where we have all been on Zoom so much that people are beginning to figure out how to actually make interesting plays for Zoom. That there was a lot of stuff, that, Zoom plays that I saw in March and April that were just disasters, horrible. Um, and some of the stuff, I mean, including what I saw last night, um, was made really interesting use of Zoom and um, was, you know, fascinating. Um, I would argue that, sorry, there's a buzzer going on, so there's going to be some background noise. Um, um, but uh, Guru of Touch was specifically written to be on Zoom, made the most of that platform and its glitches and everything we both love and hate about it, right? And so um, I think people are now adapting to these digital spaces and thinking about what it means to create performance in these digital spaces. What that's doing is creating different modes of interacting, new modes of interacting, which I hope we don't abandon all of them when we go back to quote unquote live theater, right? Um, uh, I think it's creating a kind of global coming together. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do this talk if I had to get on a plane and come. But the fact that we can do this on Zoom allows us to all get together virtually. Um, and so I think it's bringing, you know, in a bizarre way, it seems to be um, creating boundaries, but I think it's actually bringing people together. And, you know, maybe you will come in and give a lecture in my class over Zoom that you wouldn't be able to give if we had to pay for airfare and things like that, right? So maybe we can continue that even when we're back in the classroom. So uh, I think new dramaturgical structures are emerging. Um, uh, new ways of thinking about things, new modes of engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So I, in the last bit, now, this is my final question to you. And mm -hmm. then we will take some audience questions also. So yeah. my final question to you is that, do you really feel that digital theater is the way forward and future of theater? And I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me just put my um, earphones in. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of noise going on there. Um, <clears throat> sorry, one of the downsides of Zoom is I'm in the living room and, you know, my daughter needs to eat. So she's making herself some food. So that you're going to hear a little bit of cooking sounds in the background. Okay. So my final question to you is that, do you really feel that digital theater is the way forward and future of theater? And if so, why? I think every theater is the way forward. I, I don't like to, I mean, it, I, I hope this is one way forward because I think that there are some interesting components uh, of this theater that we're finally finding, right? Um, so I think some of it will stay with us. Um, I. I don't think it's the only way forward. I think live theater will come back as soon as there's a vaccine and as soon as it's safe. People have begun to do socially distanced dance pieces and theater pieces outdoors um, because that's safer. And so I think some kinds of street theater um, and site specific outdoor theater might come back sooner than those kinds of theaters where we're all packed in, you know, hundreds of us like sardines right next to each other in a space where the air doesn't circulate because that's not safe. Um, but I'm not saying this should replace live theater. I'm just saying, given the fact that this is the moment that we're in, I think it's interesting to embrace what's going on. And there's a lot of experimentation. I think artists are doing an amazing job of responding to the moment that they're in instead of shutting down and just saying, oh, we can't do anything. They're saying, well, what can we do? What, you know, how can we reinvent theater for this moment? And I think there's some really interesting reinvention work going on. And um, which I think there was not in March. You know, it's, it's taking people a while to figure out how to do this. And, you know, um, but why shouldn't this go forward? not as the only way. Why do we have to choose? I don't want to choose between curiatum 
and Ibsen and a digital murder mystery. I want them all. <laughs> so I don't think we need to choose between one or the other. I think there's room in the world for all of these um, kinds of work. So now I'm taking some questions asked by the audience who are watching okay. our show right now. Uh, one of the question, question is, your book Theater of Roots is really fantastic. You have mentioned many theater makers. I have a curiosity that are they really back to roots or they unplugging it from root and planting it in a global stage? Oh, that's interesting. Um, wait, say that last bit again. Are they really going? Uh, I have Sorry, a that was curiosity that are they really back to the roots or they unplugging it from the root and planting it in a global stage? It's about mm -hmm. utilizing the, the uh, roots, the traditions for their own theater making and selling it, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that there have been times where people have used traditional performance. And by that, I really do mean used, as in um, um, taken it out of context, right, so that they can get a grant. Um, I write about this also in my book that there was a moment in sort of the history of the Sangeet Nat Academy where in order to get a grant, you had to incorporate some uh, form of um, traditional performance. So there would be like somebody would throw in a chow move to get the grant, not because it belonged in the show or because it had anything to do with anything. And um, Girish Karnad has gone on record uh, before he died, sadly. Um, Girish Karnad went on record saying, you know, if he sees another Ganesh Puja in a modern play, he's going to scream or, you know, run screaming from the theater. Um, uh, because that, that can't be, he used it because it was a commentary on the head body divide and, you know, a divinity, et cetera, et cetera, right? There were thematic reasons as well as uh, different ways of seeing that that brought to Hayavadana, but it became a cliche of the roots movement, right? So once anything becomes a cliche or once anything, once you're making an artistic choice to get a grant or to get an international gig, you're not making art anymore. That has nothing to do with art making. That has to do with, again, I think capitalism or something, right? Yeah. I, Paniker, Paniker's, uh, just to say that I think that Paniker's motives were absolutely pure. Carnot's motives were absolutely pure. I think Theum's motives are pure. I think there are some who are just sort of like gluing that on so that they can get included in the festival or become famous or something, something. Or let's face it also to, you know, take a play to Edinburgh and have it look like, ooh, exotic Indian thing with snakes and gods and elephants and, right? That's not art. Okay. Uh, the other question is from uh, Samipendra Banerjee. And he is asking, what about breath? The strongest anti-Aristotelian in the West. You said yes. about yeah, yeah. So you said absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Brecht anti-Aristotelian, um, and I would say that that kind of episodic structure of his plays, where the audience has to really get involved and co-create the meaning. Again, it's that anti. You know, there are those plays where you just go and say like, okay, show me what you did. I paid my ticket money and now let me see, you know. That's um, a very capitalistic, right, kind of thing. Brecht is saying, as Abhinavagupta said, and this is now Abhinavagupta's gloss on the Natya Shastra and not Bharata, whoever he may or may not have been. But um, uh Abhinavagupta said you need to have experience, you need to, right? And there's a form of co-creation, right? Rasa exists, or I mean, right, what is Rasa and where does it exist? We all know there are thousands of uh, pieces of writing, but for the moment, let's agree that Rasa exists not in the performer or in the audience member, but in the interaction, in the exchange between them, right? And so... Rasa is then co-created and Brecht 
insists, not just invites, but insists that the audience does some of the work in making the meaning of the piece and in using their imagination. He says, you know, I'm not going to build all the fancy sets and actually light land a helicopter on stage or, you know, as they did in Miss Saigon or whatever. I'm going to have a blank canvas and I'm going to put a few important props on there and you're going to use your imagination to fill in the rest. You have to engage as a co-creator of this work. I would argue that that um, makes Brecht's work at least more russic than some of the other stuff. I'm, 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 let me think about that before I'm willing to put that in writing and say like, oh, Brecht's theater is russic. But um, I would not disagree with anyone who said Brecht's theater is russic. Uh, someone has asked that you said that contemporary theater is more inclined towards the russic movie. Can you elaborate upon it? How do you think that contemporary theater is inclined to Russian theory? Because nobody understands it. Okay, okay. So I actually said uh, modern theater in the 20th and 21st century. So let me, um, in my mind, okay, we have to backtrack a little bit. A little bit of backstory is required. So. Um, I, I'm sure that everyone on this call knows that Rasa uh, originates, you know, along with Sanskrit drama. We begin to hear about it in the Natya Shastra and then in the many commentaries, right, and glosses on the Natya Shastra, um, of which um, of which their number. In fact, actually, I think it begins with Valmiki in the Ramayana, right? In that um, I can't, I don't have my uh, book w books with me, but um, anyway, uh, and then with Abhinavagupta and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so I think Rasa has often been spoken about as though it is tied to a particular kind of theater and a particular geographical location. I actually think Rasa has numerous components that can also be found in other work, which is to say, I think it requires an engagement and a co-creation, right, between the partaker, I would say, and the uh, performance slash performer. It requires a dramaturgical structure that is not linear, at least in parts, that allows you, allows for nirvahanam, right? Allows you to explore different moments in great depth. It's instead of going horizontally A to B to C to D to E, right? Until you get to Z, it's sort of you get to B and then you go down and explore very deeply and then you come up and then you go over to C and you explore very deeply and you come back up. So, uh, and those explorations, those elaborations, those nerva hanam, uh, allow you to savor the moment and the performance. So again, as you all know, rasa is translated as taste, savoring, right? Exper essence. It's the emotional essence that is derived from theater, um, which is also intellectual, right? Emotion and intellect not being divorced, not part of that Cartesian mind-body divide, right? That um, um, so. Uh, it requires a certain kind of partaker, it requires a certain kind of dramaturgical structure, it requires a certain kind of engagement on the part of the audience member, etc., etc. There, are, In other words, there's a list of technical things that can create rasa. Um, I think you find those technical things not only in Sanskrit drama, but, for example, in the work of Panikkar, in the work of Kannad, and also in the work of the symbolists who actually also had colors that went with their emotions. It's, it's very much like what you read from the Ayurveda, right? Uh, Ayurvedic has, you know, different emotions are tied to different foods and different tastes and different um, colors and different, right? And so the symbolists studied a lot of that and created uh, Russic theater out of those ideas. Edward Gordon Craig um, had a long correspondence with Ananda Kumaraswamy, 
Um, and out of that, learned a lot about Rasa, Sanskrit drama, and tried to build that into his theater. Whether he was successful or not is another story. But again, um, uh, Gertrude Stein, I would argue that her form of um, const, uh, I call it cubist writing, uh, but the continuous present, um, is again a way of embodying a notion of time that I think is associated with Rasta and different viewpoints, right? We're not just going to give you the viewpoint of the playwright. There are going to be, you know, other people's interpretations that become part of this. Um, so I would argue Gertrude Stein, I would say Robert Wilson. Tadashi Suzuki has actually spoken about Rasa and uh, its influence on his thinking, as has Anne Bogart, who's very well known in the US, but um, uh, I would argue that Pina Bausch's work is Rasic. Um, so I think that some of the sort of um, most famous practitioners of theater in the 20th and 21st century um, derive their aesthetics either consciously or unconsciously in some cases from from uh the natya shastra abhinavagupta etc rather than aristotle and so i think rasa is more central to western theater than we think it is it's clearly central to Sanskrit drama, right? To Kuriyatam, to Kadagali, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and clearly central to the work of Panikar, for example. But I think it's also central to the work of Anne Bogart, which I know seems counterintuitive because I'm making a leap of both time and geography, as well as language and everything else. But um, I think if you boil Rasa down to its kind of technical components, it becomes an aesthetic theory that is not that comes from a particular time and place, but is not um, necessarily only of that time and place. I hope that answers that question. Uh, uh, there is a question coming in my mind. It might be a very layman perspective to see things like this, but suppose when we are watching a performance in India of a play called Antigen or Oedipus, anything like that. Those plays are totally in everything, in their essence. But while watching the performance, does an Indian audience can get the rasa out of it or not? Well, again, I... Not only Indian audience or British audience or American audience, whether they are getting rasa experience or not through those plays, those so-called Aristotelian plays. Well, okay, I think there are a number of ways to um, answer this question. It's a great question. <laughs> um, and it's sort of like if the tree falls in the forest and it doesn't make a, you know, doesn't make, and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Or another way of saying it is, do you have to know about Rasa to have a Rasic experience? Do you have to know about catharsis to experience catharsis, right? Um, there is actually nothing in the Natya Shastra itself that says you need to understand Rasa to have a Rasic experience. Abhinava Gupta would argue that, right? But that's a particular gloss. Um, and uh, as you know, there have been many, many productions of Antigone, which, by the way, does not actually follow Aristotle's um, <laughs> structures, right, leading to catharsis. So Antigone is an interesting question. Because, I, I mean, for example, I would say a doll's house is absolutely Aristotelian in its structure, whereas Antigone is not. Um, but there have been numerous productions of Antigone around, uh, in India. Anuradha Kapoor did one. Uh, there have been numerous productions. Um, uh, Tiam did one. Um, um, Lokendra Arambam did one, I want to say. Is that right? Uh, like it, a number of people in Manipur have done productions of Antigone, which is for obvious reasons, right? It's, she speaks truth to power, or she, right, is the voice against uh, Creon, who represents order and um, et cetera. Um, there is a fascinating production called Antigone and Ferguson, which um, after uh, the, the killing, right? And so it's, um, come back into circulation because of Black Lives Matter, because of all the people who have been killed recently by uh, police. But um, 
Uh, so the question is, can you experience catharsis if you don't know about it? I actually would argue, yes, you can, because to be honest, all those ancient Greeks hadn't read Aristotle when they were seeing those plays because Aristotle came later. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is, um, you know, do you have to know about rasa to experience it? I'm not convinced that you do. I would say that I, the first time I came to India and saw Kuriyatam, I saw Margi Madhu. And if you've seen him perform, I didn't know anything about Kuriyatam. I didn't know anything about Rasa. I didn't know anything about anything. But I knew that I was watching one of the most amazing performances. I did have somebody sort of translating the gestures and the right elaboration in front of me, but he was so good. Um, so I also think sometimes, you know, there are times where, for example, I'll go see Bharat Natyam performance and I'll think, oh gosh, I don't understand Bharat Natyam at all. It doesn't make any sense to me, even after 30 years of watching it and reading all about it and this and that and the other. I don't get it. I don't get it. And then I'll go watch a, another, you know, performance of Bharat Natyam and think, ah, oh, I get everything about it. What's not to understand? And sometimes I think that's really about the quality of the performer. And so I think if you have a brilliant performer, I'm not sure you need to have read chapter six of the Natya Shastra to experience rasa. If you have a terrible performer, maybe having read chapter six of the Natya Shastra helps you understand what should be or is supposed to be happening or what would be happening if it were actually happening. So in that sense, I think some of that knowledge can help to fill in some of those gaps. But I think when it's an amazing performance, it's an amazing performance and you get it. That's my view. Thank you, Karin. It's a wonderful session. We enjoyed a lot and we have taken five minutes more than the given time, six minutes exactly right now. So we are really apologetic for you that because we have taken a longer time from you. But it was really a very nice experience, very good experience for us to talk to you. And so really, we, we can appreciate your time which you have given to us. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. It's and just the, your questions have been wonderful. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will contact and we will try to catch you soon. Yes, thank you so much.